Good afternoon, everybody. And it's my great privilege to be at this wonderful exhibition celebrating Picasso, Infinite Modernism, and even more of a privilege to be chairing this very exciting panel, Infinite Dialogue. Um, so I, without hesitation, I'm going to introduce you to our panel. So on my left here is Marie Martin, who was commissioned by the gallery to write a very wonderful piece, which I urge you all to read, which is available over there, on the artists who've been responding to Picasso here. She interviewed several of them. Beyond her is Farah Atase, whose wonderful, wonderful painting, Bathers with Oranges, you can see behind you. She was specially commissioned to do that for this show. So welcome to both of you. And on my right here is Nazi Vazek, who has 30 years of experience as an amazing area of expertise in collections. She had her own art advisory for many years, the business of art, plus she now has her own, the Eye of Collector in its third edition. She's been at Sotheby's, she ran Masterpiece, so she's going to have a fascinating insight into what's going on in the world of all these artists responding to Picasso. Welcome to all of you. Now let's start with you, Marie as the gallery commissioned you to write this piece. Now, did you find, having talked to so many artists, that there's one major factor about Picasso that the artists continue to have an enduring artistic dialogue with, or are they all responding to something completely different about him? So, um, I, I, for prepare the, the press release for the, the exhibition, I made three interviews with uh, Peter Henley, with Farah Tassi, and with Ali Heller who is in the, in the room, but maybe she will talk after. I think there is a lot of reason why the artists still uh, follow uh, and my Picasso, of course, but there is two main reasons, I think. It's the first one is formally, of course. It's because uh, Picasso was this amazing inventor, and for 70 years, he, he continued to find new shapes, new vocabulary, new narration, new way of create a painting. And this is why it's still very uh, influences for so many artists. And the second reason I think is also because he was very in his time. He didn't escape to speak about the wars, about of course the Spanish fascism, as we can see in Guernica, if you are known. But uh, the, the two wars, he was in Paris between the two world wars, and he never hesitated to speak about that um, directly, or in a way, also with the vocabulary, with straight line, angles. Uh, yes, some paintings which are very brutal, difficult, and where we can see that he was feeling really his time. Yeah, I would say that it's really a dialogue that I uh, try to maintain with this artist, because for me, Picasso is really unique because he invented a way of painting. Um, painting is space, making space. First thing about painting is, is making space, and he invented a new vocabulary, a new way to, to, make, to create space, to make a volumetry, and so for me, this is, this is the most important thing. It's, um, it's a revolution, and also his audacity, his vitality is really uh, um, unique. It's a weapon against against like a, a kind of cynicism that can be sometimes in 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 art, unfortunately. So he has that um, unique vitality, and he invented a new way of painting. It's wonderful that we're, at least we have one of your paintings here to see tonight. But I know your dialogue with him goes way beyond this room and this show. I mean, you, last year you had three solo shows alone all over the world about re responding to Picasso. So tell us a bit more about your ongoing dialogue with him, because it's been going on for a long time, hasn't it? Way beyond here. I started to really uh, watch Picasso's work in 2015, um, I was uh, just trying to find a way to make figures. I wouldn't represent any figures in my work. It was empty spaces. And I was fascinated by the way how figures were treated like objects. He has this um, way where like, some surfaces or some lines can create volumetry and, and space without uh, shadows and just making this... Uh, amazing uh, picture solutions. So yeah, I discovered Picasso really deeply at that time, even 
even if of course I know Picasso for like everybody like forever but this this way of treating the figure was uh, really a revelation for me yeah it was really about um, making this new uh, interpretation of the human figures uh, turning to you now Nazi with your enormous experience with collectors are you seeing a lot more contemporary painters responding to Picasso as one of the 20th century's greatest artists, Picasso's um, influence on artists is profound. And I think that um, if you say why so, you have to look at him in terms of art history. He broke away from everything that was before him and continually evolved. And if you just look at his body of work, I think you know, it's estimated that he created about 150,000 artworks which is astonishing, you know, ranging from painting to sculpture and ceramics, in a 78 years of his artistic career. So that in itself is a true um, archival library of resource which artists can use and um, respond to, reinterpret, um, pay homage to, etc. I mean, it's, it's just, extremely incredible um, and then he as a man um, well he had his demons he was um, you know involved with the world um, he ha had obsessions and you know all of these themes are things that artists can really respond to and be in dialogue with as well as his technique which Farah you were talking about and um, the breadth and depth of his unparalleled output. I must say it's so inspiring being here today and seeing the, the range of responses to him. I mean, the, from the, these beautiful Peter Hallies, which is so much more beautiful in real life, it's such a privilege to see them. But Marie, just going back to you for a minute, what do you think, you know, given all the responses here, are so very different, what do you think that his, you know, if you could sum it up, what is his legacy for contemporary artists, do you think? I know it's very... Big question. <laughs> it's too big, but uh, I would like to take some example that you can see in the exhibition, and especially with the work by Tali Heller and Ginny Figgis and Connor Haddison. And um, I maybe to ask you also the question, uh, can we be feminist and like Picasso? This is a big question, <laughs> I know. Because I think Heli has a, a kind of answer, or it's also my interpretation. Because you, you, you explained to me that uh, you have been always fascinated by this painting, Le Baiser, the kiss. But you told me also that you were fascinated by the, of course, the, the Picasso is also the man who loves so much. He was passionate, passionate by women and passionate by painting at the same level. And I think the question was also for you how to deal as a woman, as a female artist, to deal with this kind of love, passion, and maybe to change the subject because you paint really men. The, the kiss is not a Yes, and I think we can read it now that the, like uh, to retake the power also as a yes, woman and female artist. I think it's the same for Geneve uh, Figgis, that you retake uh, very often the big master, Picasso, but also Goya, and you transform that. Maybe you mock a little bit at the characters. Uh, they're, they're, they're melting, they're, they're, they're dripping, they're, and, and we can see here um, a new version of Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Et Les Demoiselles d'Avignon is a very important painting, of course, because it's supposed to be the, the beginning of the Cubism. But uh, you know the story, they were a prostitute from Avignon, which is a neighborhood in Barcelona. And I think to take that team is, is, is means something, and it could be also a little bit ridiculous, but maybe also, again, fin, maybe it's my interpretation, but to take the power and to change this male gaze and it's true that Picasso was typically uh, a man. Huh? Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> really, again, uh, with a very strong yes. And maybe now, I think the artist, it's very important to say that they don't want to cancel it, but they want to reread it and maybe to read it uh, in another way. And I think the same with Connor Addison. So I don't know if I, you have thought about this to change this kind of 
gaze into more feminist uh, way of, maybe not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I, I don't feel uh, as a woman when I make a painting. I mean, I'm just painting, but uh, yeah, maybe unconsciously because my models, some people say that my models are like self-portraits because they are fictive. I don't have actually models in my studio. Yes, there's a, a lot of questions uh, that are about uh, the representation. And in my painting, I stage this model uh, that are into uh, uh, studios. So yes, there's a lot of un unconscious level, I'm sure. But uh, the reasons why I look at Picasso are really like to find the solutions, to find the for formal pictorial solutions, because I believe that when you are into a dialogue, uh, you find much more solutions, otherwise it's sterile. If you just want to express yourself and express your personality or something in a painting, I, I don't see the point. I, I like this idea of being involved with the dialogue because I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not sterile then. It's interesting for, her. and so that's what I'm doing with, with Picasso or other modernists. I'm really trying to find uh, solutions and about the status of the woman, I'm not sure yet. Uh. I think you've actually just answered uh, my next question for you with that, because I was going to ask you about, because so you, you've expressed before a little bit of squeamishness about this word dialogue, that it can be seen as a little bit negative. And you said this really interesting thing, which I'm just, just going to read here. You, s you say a dialogue is, is goes beyond just sort of backwards and forwards, that it's a plastic project that goes behind beyond an aesthetic influence. And I'd just be really interested to know a bit more. You, you've begun to answer it with what you were just saying. That it's, it's so, so just expand a bit more. I think that's really interesting. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just that this efficiency uh, that Picasso found, again, this new way of painting, like uh, with a dot, you can make eyes, and with this uh, like audacity, but this subtlety. So for me, it's a all new vocabulary. And uh, that's what I was talking about. Um, I think that uh, through time, you we can build bridges and continue this conversation over and over. So just going back to you now, Nazi, um, I mean, obviously, Picasso isn't the first artist that, that contemporary artists have responded to. But in wi with, with you, who's got such an experience of looking at so many different paintings, Obviously, you've seen a lot of contemporary artists influenced by historic painters. But does Picasso, 50 years after his death, still stand out? Well, um, it's true to say that artists um, look to preceding art and artists in their work, you know, like Bacon with Velasquez and, um, you know, Glenn Brown with Rembrandt and uh, Caroline Walker with Vermeer, etc. But with regards to Pe Picasso, most definitely, I mean, you know, um, Hock and you talked about being influenced by him greatly. Kondo responds directly to his Cubist portraits um, in his portraits of madness of everyday life. Michaeline Thomas created this incredible work um, in response to um, the Charnel House by Picasso, which was dealing with the atrocities of the Holocaust. And Michaeline was dealing with racism. And in this show, um, we have a, an incredible work on paper by a self-taught artist called um, Timothy Curtis. His works are downstairs. They are amazing. And Timothy was incarcerated for a while. He's a self-taught artist. And his interpretation of the Guernica in relation to his time in prison is just extraordinary. So please do have a look at this strong work. And it's, it's elements like that that Picasso draws out of. So it's not just stylistic influences as in historical artists such as Rembrandt. It's a subject matter. It's a deep human connection um, that he's drawing out, which I think makes him one of the, the, the greatest um, influences on contemporary art. Well, that actually was sort of going to be one of my last questions to all of you in that... I think a lot of it, what you're saying is, you know, so many contemporary painters responded to the, his absolute engagement with his time, you know, Guernica and, and Massacre in Korea and, and all that. But, but Farah, I think what's interesting about your work, you're very interested in his ways of expression, new ways of expression. So how do you see his influence continuing? I'd like just all of you to, to, to think about that. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's going to to last. Uh, I think it's um, like a timeless language that he created, and um, more and more now we see young artists that uh, are in inspired or are into this dialogue with Picasso. Uh, it's it's more and more. Uh, there are more and more like out, and and we can find them. Like I think that ten years ago. Uh, I felt really alone, uh, or and I feel that now it's more and more artists that uh, assume it, or we can see we can see them. Yeah, I think the first part of the work by Picasso, mostly um, dialing by the artist, was the cubist part, <laughs> and we can see now it's more and more the surrealistic part, like we can see also in the exhibition work by Ginny Cassé. Uh, you can see downstairs, and you can see really this melting form, uh, the, the painting where the, the floor is unstable, all the shapes are unstable, and it's really like homey, like uh, furniture that you know, uh, uh, object that you know, but they are really strange, also dripping, and it's really like, uh, as I told <laughs> you yesterday when we were preparing the talk, the l'inquiétante étrangeté de, de Freud, the uncanny, that was published in 1990. And I think that we will see more and more artists taking up this part. And again, maybe talking about the, 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 the world we are living in, and which is especially now in, uh, in trouble. And the artists, they, if they, even if they don't want to represent war, they, they, they show in the work the shapes. I think you can see that even more with you, Farah, as an artist, the shapes, even the colors, the way you present the painting, that's they, they feel a kind of anxiety and dangerous time. And, uh, and even in that work, you know, by Alejandro Cardenas, it's really related to, of course, biomorphism, surrealism. But it shows also when the, the human is a little bit, it doesn't know where it goes. And so I think this is now, we will see more and more work related to that. And maybe after with a kind of trans, humanism, we will see. That's really interesting, because I know we were talking yesterday about w his great resonance is because he was so acutely able to, to capture a sense of turbulence and, and strange times, which is what we're living in. So, so just as you've kind of answered the question I was going to come to, just to end with you, Nazi, because I, I know everyone wants to go and look at the paintings and ask some questions. So you, how, how do you see the future with, you, you are seeing more and more artists responding. I, I'm gonna answer that by just um, talking about this show a little bit. I had a very quick look, as you can probably tell, just before we started, but I'm truly impressed by it. It's 22 artists responding to Picasso, and they all have very individual outputs and reactions towards him. But the one thread I saw as I walked around the galleries is humanity and the human form. And, you know, everyone from um, Sean Landers at the back of the um, exhibition with a con sort of contorted figure, female figure, and you can't, you can't quite tell whether she's ecstatic or she's in excruciating pain. You know, um, Jenny Figgis' uh, wonderful um, interpretation, you know, she interprets um, Le... Um, Demoiselle d'Avignon, which was the uh, precursor to Cubism. I mean, it was the, you know, th that's astounding. Um, you have got Tersic and Mill, um, who I just have fallen in love with. Um, they've got two works in the show. One is uh, a depiction of Maya, which Picasso had painted of his daughter Maya in 1938, which is usually thought of as being tender and joyful but they have completely reinterpreted it um, and passed on their own narrative in that Maya in the original picture is holding a boat. In their painting in the gallery, she's holding like a dinosaur <laughs> and you wonder who that dinosaur might be. <laughs> and then the other picture that they've done is a, uh, taken from a photograph, famous photograph of Picasso where he's wearing a Breton top, which everyone knows, but actually the head of um, on, the, on this um, painting is a monster. Mm. So whatever you think of him, he's 
infinite modernism and influence is just going to continue because he is as relevant today as he was in his day. He lived in tumultuous times, and we do that today. Um, I don't think I need to say any more. Thank you so much, Nadia. And um, we have run out of time now, and so I'm going to let everybody go and look around the gallery. But please join me in thanking our panel so much. Thank you.